conference finals. The mood in the town is hopeful, but we all know there's still work to be done. And that could be one way to summarize the message of the report that we'll be discussing today. Uh, let me say a few words about the origins of that report. Since 2005, Education Next has taken a leading role in analyzing the rigor of state standards for student proficiency in the foundational subjects of mathematics and reading. The Ednex reports compare state's definitions of proficiency to that of the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which recent work suggests are well aligned to the goal of ensuring that students graduate from high school ready for college level work. And they assign each grade a state, each state a grade based on whether their own standards are similarly demanding. The report being released today represents the seventh in this series. The methodology has remained the same, but the context has changed dramatically over that period. In 2005, No Child Left Behind had only recently made the definition of proficiency central to school accountability systems nationwide. By 2009, many states had joined forces with the encouragement of the federal government in an attempt both to improve the quality of their academic content standards and to raise expectations for proficiency through the effort known as the Common Core. By 2015, it became possible to see whether those efforts had paid off. And today, drawing on data from the latest 2017 administration of the National Assessment of Educational Progress, Daniel Hamlin and Paul Peterson provide the first look at this question in the era of the Every Student Succeeds Act, a law that explicitly limits any federal oversight of states' decisions in this area. So have standards slipped over the past two years as federal oversight has diminished? And is there any evidence that the changes in the rigor of state standards that have occurred over the past decades have mattered for how much students learn? Those are among the questions that Paul Peterson will be addressing for us today. As many of you know, Paul's a professor of government at Harvard University, a senior fellow here at the Hoover Institution, and senior editor of Education Next. He's also been the author or a co-author of each of this series of reports dating back to 2015. So Paul's gonna take about 15 minutes to present the report's findings. And then we're going to invite uh, an excellent group of panelists to join him for a discussion. I'll introduce them then. So for now, Paul, please take it away. Thank you, Marty, for that introduction. And thank you all for coming today. Uh, and thank you uh, especially to uh, Daniel Hammond for all the hard work that he did to uh, find out what every state was doing. Some states don't want to tell you what they're doing, so it takes a lot of work to dig it out. But he did manage to find it for every single state this year, which is a particular triumph. Uh, so what do we find? Um, well, as Marty said, the motivation of this is to see whether or not uh, states are setting uh, high standards and how they compare to one another and uh, how they compare over time. And we use the National Assessment for Educational Progress in order to, to make this assessment because the National Assessment of Educational Progress is a, given to every state. And so we know how every student, I mean, how every state is doing in terms of educating its students up to a particular level of proficiency defined by the national assessment uh, in fourth grade and eighth grade in reading and math. So that gives us a norm against which we can compare what states are doing with their own standards. And the takeaways are threefold. The good news is that the standards that rose quite dramatically between 2009 and 2015, which we reported two years ago or three years ago, uh, they have remained at this new higher standard through 2017, which is the last time that we can really observe this. We can't observe things for the current 2018 testing round. So we also know that the passage of the new federal law, Every Student Succeeds Act, which uh, forbids the federal setting of standards, has not yet had a negative effect on what states are doing. Um, it may be that this is something that could change in the future, but it hasn't as of now. That was passed in 2015, so it's, you know, it's now been two years since 
uh, since the passage of that law, and we don't see any significant change nationwide. The disturbing news is that we don't see an improvement in student performance in those states that raise their standards the most. So we will reach that point uh, towards the end of the presentation. So, um, okay, what do we mean by state standards? There's some confusion over this. Uh, part of this one definition is that it's the curriculum that counts. Curricular standards is the setting of goals and the, the material that needs to be mastered in order to uh, reach what some people think you should know at a particular grade level. And then the other standard, which I think is the more meaningful one, is the proficiency standard, and that is how well do students achieve relative to those goals, and is the bar that is set for achievement set at a high level, or is the bar set at a lower level? Because you can have the most wonderful aspirations in the world, and if you have an easy bar, Yes, everybody needs to know calculus, but if you know uh, 1 and 1 equals 2 and that's part of calculus, well, then that's not much of a standard for measuring calculus. So it, it, the proficiency standards, the bar of performance that you need to pass is the one that is really, really important, at least in my view. So um, Common Core State Standards was addressed to both of these questions. A lot of attention in the public discourse focused in on the curriculum that was to be provided, not the proficiency bar that was to be established. But really, the two are so intertwined, you can't really discuss the one with the, without uh, discussing the other. And so by looking at proficiency, we are making some comment on the content as well. So the methodology is pretty simple. You just simply compare whether or not the percentage of students who are declared proficient on the state exam is the same as the percentage that are declared proficient on the NAEP. If they're the same, then you say, okay, they have as high standards as NAEP. You, you can't be proficient on the NAEP without being proficient on your state standards and vice versa. They're the same thing. So we give those states that do that an A. Now, actually, uh, some states have set higher standards than the NAEP in some subjects in some grade levels. Uh, and so maybe it's just a rounding error, maybe it's just a testing error. Or so, but, but, so we sort of ignore that because it's not that much higher. So you, if, if a state, we don't give out A pluses, right? We don't, Harvard does that, we don't do that. <laughs> uh, so we just give A's and uh, to a state that has a bar that's as high or as higher, uh, and or even if they're close, if they're in the territory, if they're if they're within the range of the NAEP, we we will say that that state is performing at that level. But if it's lower, that is to say, if a higher percentage of students are found proficient on the state exam than on the national exam, that's a, that's a sign that that standard is is weaker. That bar has been set lower then we give it a lower grade. So, and uh, in the past, we've given out Fs. We gave an F to the state of Tennessee commissioner. You have to explain that. Yeah, F to Tennessee, three Fs we gave them. 2003, 2005, 2007, I think we gave them an F. There were other states as well, but so uh, this is, uh, the, the, this is a, the grade of A is not automatically given out. It's not like my colleagues in the government department. We don't give automatic A's here, right? Um, so this is sort of what Marty's already said. Uh, I don't think I need to go over that point again. The only point that really needs to be mentioned is that our our own evaluation system has changed over time because we have a grading system that's got to be able to compare every state with one another and every state over time with itself. So we're always adding new information into our definition of how effective you are. 
So some states that were getting A's for what they were doing back in 2009 will not get an A for what they were doing in 2009 by the new standards that have now been set because standards are constantly rising in the country. So everything is in comparison to one state with another and to states with themselves over time. So this means that as standards are rising, the grades that we gave to states in the past tend to go down. So if you go back and read our old reports and say, well, why don't they match up with the current report? Well, that's, that's the reason. Uh, now, we did have the U.S. Department of Education check up on us back in 2007 because some of our grades back then were pretty bad grades. We were giving out these D's and F's and C minuses. And there was a lot of uh, people said, oh, you can't believe this study. Uh, and so the U.S. Department of Education was persuaded to do its own rather elaborate several million dollar uh, undertaking to try to see whether or not we were in fact doing this correctly and I'm uh, eternally grateful for that work because they came up with a finding that was almost identical to ours with respect to how well states were doing and our results have never been controversial since that time. Uh, um, so Finally, just as part of the intro, I want to emphasize that this is not a, a information about how well kids are doing in school. This is only a measure of how high the bar is being set for evaluating students. So we'll come to the last question at the very end. Okay, so what happened in 2009? In 2009, uh, we got the stimulus package, we got race to the top, we got waivers from NCLB, or if not right in 2009, in the immediate aftermath, and we got the campaign for higher standards, the Common Core undertaking. And so we decided to really focus in this report on what's happened between 2009 and 2017. And if you look at this graph, it really tells the story. This is the whole story in this one graph, I would say. Uh, it shows you that initially states had set very low standards and they didn't do anything to improve them until the Common Core Initiative uh, was proposed, until Race to the Top and the Waiver Initiative were undertaken. And then you had this huge uptick uh, so that by 2015, the gap between NAEP and uh, the state standards was 10 percentage points instead of 30 percentage points or more. And uh, now the latest finding is, is that that transformation has not uh, deteriorated between 2015 and 2017. If anything, the standards have gone up. Oop, did I go too far? But, and this is the bad news, uh, we don't see any connection between the changes in standards that took place between 2009 and 2015 and student performance improvements between 2009 and 2017. Because you can look on the NAEP and you can see how well students are doing on the NAEP today as compared to the past. And you can see that the District of Columbia, where we are today, has made very substantial gains. I mean, if every state in the United States had improved at the same rate as the District of Columbia, we would be having a celebration. I mean, there would be people clamoring to be the father of this fantastic transformation of the American educational system. I don't know why people don't talk more about what's going on in the District of Columbia. It's really quite amazing. There's a story to be told there. Now, maybe it's partly a demographic story uh, that there's, there's been uh, the middle class uh, black community has moved back into the district and so has uh, the middle class white community in part because the schools are better in the district than they were when my children went to them some years ago back in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, big, big changes here in the District of Columbia. Um, but um, 
it hasn't been that way for most of the states. And uh, nationwide, as we know, the NAEP has shown no significant improvements uh, in student performance over the, the last eight years. Um, in contrast to what had been happening nationwide in the 10 years before that. So we, we have to be really concerned about the fact that students aren't learning. So what role does the standards have to play in all of this? And uh, what this graph shows you is that some states did a lot to improve their standards. Uh, Tennessee is off the charts here in terms of improving its standards. It went from an F to an A. Uh, made the biggest gain of any single state uh, in the United States in terms of raising its standards. And if you look over there on the graph, you can see that actually, uh, if you look you know, above the, red, the dotted red line and you look uh, way over to the right-hand side, you can see that Tennessee is one of mm, about the top 10 states. I mean, there are some other states that have also raised standards I mean, I've also seen improvements in student performance, California and Mississippi and Arizona, uh, and the, the, some others there, uh, in, including Tennessee in the next tier. Uh, but then there are a lot of states where student performance has declined. And overall, there's no connection at all between increasing standards and increasing student performance. When you get a flat line like that red line is, that means there's no relationship between the two variables. The two variables are completely orthogonal to one another. So we don't know if that's a permanent relationship or whether the state standards that have been, now that they have risen, whether over the next few years we will see a rise in student performance as teachers learn how to implement those standards and, and apply a curriculum uh, that is expected to improve student performance. Maybe something will improve in the future, but as of now, we can't see that there has been the payoff that many in the Common Core State Standards Movement had anticipated. So thank you. We have a uh, excellent panel assembled for you all uh, to respond to the report and to Paul's presentation of it. Uh, I will offer them brief introductions, uh, starting with Dr. Candace McQueen in the middle of the panel. She was sworn in as Tennessee's Commissioner of Education in January 2015, where she's led a major statewide effort to create a new strategic plan for schools called Tennessee Succeeds. It's focused on increasing post-secondary and career readiness for all of the state students and serves as the foundation for the state's recently improved ESSA plan. Uh, prior to serving as Commissioner of Education, she's been a classroom teacher, a university faculty member and department chair, and most challenging of all, Dean of a College of Education. Uh, to her left is Robert Pondicio, Senior Fellow and Vice President for External Affairs at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. He is also a senior advisor to Democracy Prep Public Schools, a network of high-performing charter schools based in Harlem, New York, that we recently uh, learned is having some really significant impacts on the civic participation of the students it serves. He writes and speaks extensively and, I have to say, eloquently on education and education reform issues with an emphasis on literacy, curriculum, and teaching. Finally, Catherine Brown is Vice President for Education Policy at the Center for American Progress. She previously served as Vice President of Policy at Teach for America, and before that as Senior Education Policy Advisor for the House Committee on Education and Labor under then Chairman George Miller of California. In 2008, she also served as the Chief Domestic Policy Advisor for presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. So we have a, a great group to dive into these findings. Um, I have some questions for them, but I'm gonna encourage them as well to ask them and respond to one another. Um, but I'll start with you, Candace, if that's all right. Um, we just saw that between 2009 and 2017, Tennessee went from having just about the lowest proficiency standards in the nation to among the very highest. So how exactly did this change come about and what role has this increase in standards played in Tennessee's broader and apparently 
somewhat successful effort to improve student achievement? Well, I appreciate the question. I think having an F from Education Next, and we had a two to three Fs from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce back in 2007. So if you look at the Fs from 2007 to 2010, it was not a good day in Tennessee um, any day of the 365 days a year or those years. So I will say there was a, a, a coalition that truly began with these Fs. And there was a wake-up call moment where our state had industry leaders from across the state as well as our uh, business partners in our local communities uh, through our chambers, through some of our business roundtable, we began um, on a pathway to raising standards. And I will say it's now a little over a decade. It has been five different standard changes over uh, about 12 years that have moved us to ultimately where we believe we have you know, a, a gold standard set of standards in our state. But that has been a variety of people making the right decisions over multiple years with two governors that have been very aligned over now 16 years uh, around education issues, one a Democrat and one a Republican, but very aligned in terms of what we have to do to connect educational outcomes and our human capital to our economy and our state. And so that work collectively has um, been an achievement that we're very proud we finally have an A and we can talk <laughs> about that. So. Uh, so Catherine, you watch this issue not just in a particular state, but nationwide. So uh, how do you react to what we've seen over the past eight or so years? Um, what are your main takeaways? Um, yeah, well, I first just want to thank you so much for having me here. This is a great event and a, and a, and a really thought-provoking and useful report and resource for the field. Um, and I will say I don't, I don't think anything in it was particularly surprising. And I think those of us that worked on the Common Core when we were implementing it thought that it was the first step. I mean, really, standards-based reform has been going on for a long time. And it's been an effort to raise student achievement. And getting high standards in place is incredibly important and foundational. But it's obviously not going to lead immediately to students learning to that standard. And so um, to me, it just reinforced, I think, where the field is going now, which is a real need for strong, aligned instructional materials and curriculum that will help teachers actually learn the standards, to internalize them themselves, to be able to teach them. Um, even though the standards have been in place for eight years, or at least the Common Core, um, as recently as last year, Ed Reports came out with an analysis of textbooks and found that very, very few textbooks were actually aligned, even though many textbook publishers were claiming that they were aligned. Um, we, you know, we're still seeing teachers come through the system themselves who are learning. We have many teachers still in the field who, who weren't taught by these, you know, particularly when it comes to math, very different way of thinking and teaching math. So I think it just reinforces, I, I think the, that chart that shows where the Common Core was implemented and then the very high alignment is very encouraging and exciting and it has done what, you know, we all thought that it would do. But there's a tremendous amount of work going forward, and Tennessee can really prove as a proof point for how other states could model their own systems. Robert, that leads actually quite nicely into what I had thought of asking you first. Now, you've written a lot about the, I would say, limited but important role that academic content standards can play in educational improvement efforts. But I don't think I've heard you sort of comment on the role of proficiency standards. Uh, and what role they play, could play, should play, uh, or whether they're something of a distraction. Um, a lot of what I would want to say would echo what Catherine just said. Um, and I'll push back a little bit on Dr. Peterson uh, in saying, and I don't want to misquote you, when you talked about that, that the, the, the lack of relationship between rising standards and test score growth is the bad news. It's the news, period. The other stuff is is kind of you know table setting, but but that is the news, and and I think that's because and I'm speaking now with my classroom teacher hat on uh, of this just kind of profound disconnect between the exercise of standard setting and student achievement. Uh, I mean, I've made a joke uh, about this over the years that as a classroom teacher, never once did I take down the New York State learning standards to decide what am I going to teach tomorrow. So the analogy I've always used is to um, analogize uh, academic standards with say building code or auto safety standards. You know, it, it, the, the food safety handling procedures do not dictate what I'm going to have for breakfast this morning. You know, now, if I go to my local greasy spoon, you know, then, then it, might, it might dictate how they handle that. But the idea that suddenly that restaurant is going to get better because food safety handling procedures have been tightened up, I, the logic of that is, has always been lost upon me. Um, 
I have been a, a, um, a proponent of Common Core, but, but I always have to say there's a but coming, and that but is merely because it's the one thing that we've done in the last 20 or so years that invites a conversation about curriculum, about instruction, about um, professional development, about all these things that our ed reform colleagues tend to lose interest in. We, we assume we set the standards and then our work is done, and I feel like a broken record on this. Um, our, our, the problem is not setting standards or agreeing to standards. The problem is meeting standards. Even when our standards were low, we had trouble meeting them. You know, we could monkey with the proficiency rates and declare ourselves proficient, but there was no real evidence of improvement even when standards were lower. So it's utterly unsurprising, to Catherine's point, that there's, there's no relationship between standards and test scores. Why would you think there would be? If you're laboring under the misconception that there's all this excess capacity in K-12 just waiting for higher standards and direction and energy to be achieved, well, where did you get that idea? Well, I certainly think a lot of proponents of higher standards put forward the notion that these would be, if not sufficient on their own, a necessary driver of... Well, sure, and that, that's, that's my point, Marty, which is it sets the table. Okay, this is where we're going, so it's set expectations, that's a good thing, but it does nothing in terms of helping uh, states uh, arm teachers with what they need to meet those standards, which is why I'm eager to hear how Tennessee has, has, has figured this out. And I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot of dry and lovely details around curriculum and professional development, et cetera, et cetera. That's the real work of this. Yeah, so let's zero in on one of the issues that Catherine raised, which is just the problem of determining what curriculum is aligned to standards in a legitimate way, not just sort of putting some stamp on the cover. How do you all in Tennessee, if at all, try to exercise control over the decisions that school boards and districts are making in round curriculum? Yeah, I appreciate that Robert and Catherine both brought that up. I mean, the implementation matters. I mean, the standards were the driver, but what has made a difference and why we think Tennessee, you know, it at least appears to be a bit of an outlier, and we've still got a lot of work to do, it's because of implementation. Now, we know there's a disconnect on the materials and resources that are in every district to meet these standards. Uh, we realized that pretty quickly. Why? Because teachers on our educator survey that we give every year, we're a state that gives a survey every year, and the vast majority of our teachers take it. And we can see that every year they have said, for the last five years, we don't have the materials and resources that actually fully align to our standards. So we're going to struggle to actually meet those at the expectation until that alignment occurs. So we listened. And we've created um, what we consider uh, really strong resources around reading as a bridge strategy as we move to our textbook adoption. And we're creating a textbook adoption cycle that actually is very robust around the instructional shifts, not just putting a new sticker on an old book that says aligned to you know, Tennessee academic standards. And we're doing that with teachers. The teachers have been part of the strategy. We have statewide literacy coaching that was implemented two or three years ago, and that has helped us meet these standards. We've created units that are aligned. That is a bridge strategy that allows our K-1, 2, and 3 teachers actually see what the high expectations look like at this very low um, age range so they can push on that in terms of implementation. Our implementation has been teacher heavy. It's about the teachers coming to the table, saying what they need, creating the instructional strategies and the coaching networks that they need, and then making sure that we align our standards implementation to actual instructional work, um, not disconnected where I think some years ago it was we just kept unpacking standards. You know what I mean? We just kept unpacking standards. What's the verb? What's the noun? What does the standard mean? We've now finally transitioned to what's the task that's associated with mm. the standard? What's the performance expectation? What curriculum and resources do you need then in the classroom in terms of rigorous text to meet that? And that is a real shift. And when you push on that, teachers realize, wow, this is what I have to do now to actually meet this standard. And it is very different than our conversation even five or six years ago. Robert, we asked you to look into one state that was undertaking some similar activities, Louisiana, for Education Next about yep. a year ago. Yep. Do you want to 
share with well, people I, and I'm not what familiar with from that the Tennessee. Uh, that's why I was interested to hear if, if they're, they've gone the, the Louisiana route. But the thing that I and and I'll be candid, I was a little bit disappointed that Louisiana doesn't fare a little bit better on on this chart. But but I'm a patient man. I think you know it, <laughs> these things take some time. Um, what I liked about what Louisiana did is they're a local control state. And uh, under John White and Rebecca Cockler, his chief academic uh, officer, they instituted a system of, of, of evaluating and tiering curriculum. Uh, I'm going to broadly oversimplify this, the way this works. So you're, you're, you need to adopt an ELA curriculum. Well, they're not telling you which one to adopt, but they're evaluating, using teachers to evaluate tier one, tier two, tier three. If you adopt a tier one, a curriculum that meets all the standards, then you get all manner of incentives. You get professional development that is aligned not to general pedagogy or classroom management, but, but PD on that curriculum. Um, so, and, and then assessments align to that. So it's a very nicely uh, organized uh, way of, of using state power to, to um, I think Re Rebecca Cockler says, to make the good choice the easy choice. Uh, and, and again, it's not like they're, they're you know, there's, it's not heavy handed that they're saying you, you have to use this one. There really is a range. You know, there's, there's lots of ways to meet the standards. But, but what, it, what it does is it, it's a vision that I think um, works with what I was describing before. It's using the, the, the standards as a starting point and say, okay, now, now let's talk curriculum, let's talk pedagogy, let's talk assessment, let's make sure everything is working in the same direction. It's using the standards as a starting line, not a finish line. So, Paul, are you just not a patient enough man? <laughs> uh, is that the, by producing this chart, which is looking for you know, something akin to a very short-term impact, especially given that you're looking at improvement over 2009 to 2017, but if I see the timing of the improvement in standards that you documented, really that was a 2011 to 2015 phenomenon most of all. And as I hear Candace and Robert talk, they're talking about, some processes that I would imagine taking quite a while before you would see impacts on student achievement. Well, I'm too old to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm old enough to remember uh, the uh, Nation at Risk report uh, back in 1982, um, 83, uh, that um, you know, that report really had quite a profound impact on uh, student performance as measured by the SAT. The SAT student performance had been falling just systematically for a decade or two, and it stops in 1983, and it is a little V there on, on a chart. It goes down, and it goes back up again. And it, going back up again is not as steep as the going down was, but it, it reversed directions. And, uh, and if you look at um, what was happening around the country as measured by NAEP, you could see that, especially in the South, uh, African Americans were doing a lot better. It was quite a dramatic improvement during the 1980s. And, you know, we didn't have any standards then. And you know, it, what was going on there, and I think what was going on was there was a, uh, there was a lot of public exhortation. There was a lot of there was a mood in the country that said, we've got to do something about our educational system. I mean, I thought the report itself, the nation at risk, was a bunch of balderdash, didn't say anything <laughs> worth listening to. But psychologically and, and politically, it had a dramatic effect on uh, people's thinking about the importance of education. And I feel we don't have that today. And I, the Common Core was not able to produce that effect. Instead, we got a divisive effect. We, we started fighting over what it meant and whether it was a going dumbing down standards or raising standards, and it got politicized. And, and I, so I feel like, you know, I, I think you can get dramatic change. It does not, doesn't necessarily have to take a long time. Uh, look at what the South Koreans were able to do. Uh, you you got to realize they were one of the lowest performing countries in the world in 1955. They had been controlled by the Japanese. They had gone through wars. They were just, uh, then there was the Korean War on top of all the other wars. And uh, they were a desperate nation. And they said, we got to do something about this because we are on the fringe of totalitarian regimes and we have to really develop our human capital. And they figured out a way to do it. And they did it rather quickly, amazingly quickly, uh, even if the full fruits of it are only being felt today. Uh, so, yeah. So that's what you were 
that's the mechanism by which you're thinking that there could be an immediate impact. And so I guess what we're learning is that suddenly changing the percentage of students that we're reporting are proficient does not have that kind of transformative impact. The media doesn't care. Uh, and so, Catherine, to you, uh, mm -hmm. does proficiency uh, does proficiency matter anymore, and do state definitions of proficiency hmm. matter? Uh, in 2005, when Ednex started doing this series of reports, uh, the definition of proficiency was actually quite central to the design of school accountability systems and needed to be because of the federal control of them. In a variety of ways, ESSA makes proficiency less central. Um, and allows states to, uh, I guess, make it less central in their school accountability system. So you know, does the definition of proficiency matter anymore, and, and why? Uh, that's an interesting question. I need to think a little bit. I, the one thing I would say is I do think uh, one of the challenges of Common Core, one of the reasons we haven't maybe seen it transform the focus on education that we did see with the nation at risk was it came at the same time as the Great Recession and disinvestment in schools. And so there were a lot of forces on schools, which the report does a nice job of laying out, that I think were count countervailing forces when it came to actually raising student achievement. And obviously, the 80s was a different scenario. Um, but does I mean, proficiency does still matter. I, I'm a strong believer that things that are measured get focused on. And so even though they may have less weight in state accountability systems, they still are in accountability systems, almost every state. I, I believe every state. Um, certainly. No, I think some have. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, for example, has gone in the direction of reporting average scaled scores rather than proficiency rates as okay. its sort of core all-student metric. Including subgroups? They're not looking at? Uh, uh, in terms of what's included in the accountability yeah, system, okay. yeah. OK. But I would still argue that. Um, performance on state proficiency tests is still important. It's still something that um, teacher evaluation systems in a lot of districts and states still look at. Um, and it's something that parents look at. I mean, these, these tests still go out to parents. They get individual ratings of where their children are on different proficiency measures. That was one of the exciting things about the Common Core, that you were going to be able in a clearer way to know what your child was supposed to know at the end of each grade and then how far they were progressing towards that standard. So. Um, I, I mean, I think it's a good move that ESSA made that we're also now thinking about things like chronic absenteeism and school climate and other things that we know families deeply value when it comes to, you know, helping their children grow into the people they want them to be. But I don't think we're going to, I mean, because of all the things that um, Paul mentioned, the economic competitiveness around the world, we, we are still, we, if anything, parents, I think, feel more anxiety about the world that their children are entering. And so they're more focused on... Um, their grades and their and their scores on tests beyond state accountability systems. Kenneth, do parents pay attention to these sort of language around proficiency when they learn that about their student? Yeah, absolutely. And I would start by saying in our ESSA plan, we really put a stake in the ground around proficiency as well as growth. Right? Both of those really matter, and those are elevated across all of our student groups as well. So I think it provided states even a chance to restate what they found most important. And we dug deeper into the student groups, our subgroup, um, to make sure that that was more elevated in the conversation, to make sure that the equity component was more present across the state as we looked at rating different districts. But I would say oh, parents, absolutely they do. I, I feel like that has been one of the mistakes that we've potentially made is that we have not elevated what parents, uh, one, understand or can understand about their student individual uh, measures. We've made it so complex. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we have uh, brand new reports that parents get and students get, and it's you know icon-driven, it's colors, it's very user-friendly language. Uh, but we would hold that up now against what we used to use, and it looked like the back of a credit card insert, you know, like how complicated that is to read and understand. That's what we used to give parents in our state. Well, no wonder they weren't invested in what that meant or how they could help their child. You couldn't even read it. It was, it was, it was so complicated. So now we have really shifted to a very consumer-friendly reporting that allows this to be put in, well, what are the strengths? 
what are areas for improvement? We even have a section of what should you do next now that you have this data uh, at your fingertips. And that has now created an investment that we would not have had even two or three years ago. So it still matters, parents want that. And I get excited when we can actually provide that for parents in a way that's very usable on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I've seen a number of surveys showing that the vast majority of parents think their child is on track to be college ready when we know from the national assessment that a minority actually are. It will be very interesting to me to see how, if at all, that changes once states undertake these efforts to be more transparent at the individual family level about these judgments, which I agree with you, I don't think has been easy for uh, families to make uh, so far. Robert, I saw you you nodding at various points yeah. over there. Let, um, let me respond to a couple of things. <laughs> um, first, uh, what Dr. Peterson was saying about his disappointment with uh, you know the, the, the lack of energy, media attention, etc. Um, I immediately thought of my first year in the classroom, which was uh, in 2002, just as No Child Left Behind uh, brought grade, uh, uh, grade level testing to my grade, fifth grade. Uh, so let me set the scene for you. It's 2002. Um, I'm teaching in literally the, the poorest performing school in the lowest performing district in the city of New York, uh, in District 7, the South Bronx. Um, and a remarkable thing happened, to your point, Dr. Peterson. Uh, there was an effect that is akin to any job when, oh, the boss is coming, look busy. Um, and I'm not being dismissive of that, that's important. Suddenly it's like, oh, we're all testing grades right now, we gotta get our act together, we didn't use the word act. Um, and that had a nice short-term effect. That wrung the instant excess capacity just by the act of sitting up and, and applying ourselves a little bit more. You know, any complacency that we had was gone. And that was it. You know, and then we went back to being, we never got good. We got a little bit less bad than we were. And, but it's still, that school to this day, 20 years later, is still the poorest performing school in the poorest performing district in the city of New York, um, which says something or should say something. Um, so now let me you know, perhaps uh, risk committing career suicide in public. Um, I, I think we have to reckon with the fact that perhaps we have reached the limits of what we can achieve as policymakers. And so back to your question about ESSA, it makes all the sense to me in the world that the center of gravity should, should uh, shift to states because whatever additional achievement is to be wrought is only going to come from what I have described um, in EdNex and elsewhere as a reform-based, or sorry, a, a practice-based vision of ed reform. We have to improve curriculum, pedagogy, professional development. You can't do that at the, at the national level. That, can on, that is only the work of, of states and districts and schools. So this is it, folks. Or at least I think we have to recognize that there, we may be bumping up against the limits of what we can achieve from here in Washington. Catherine, you want to respond to that? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't. I don't largely disagree. I think Washington has a really important role to play in terms of allocating funding, particularly to low-income students. And we're seeing more and more evidence that, and, and for a long time, there's been a narrative in the ed reform circles that funding doesn't matter and everything can get fixed as long as you have high-performing, hard-working teachers. I think that has been largely debunked. And so, you know, Title I still plays a really important role. I think having accountability systems, um, so I think federal policy anyway does set the stage. It creates transparency and again it sends resources to the places that need it most. It doesn't do that as well as it could. We all think I think Title I formula could be much, much more targeted. Let but, me ask let me ask yeah. a more focused question about okay. federal policy, which specifically involves the the real core topic here, which is federal oversight of of state standards. Uh, I assume the Center for American Progress was in favor of requiring federal approval of standards, uh, um, ensuring that they are actually sort of aligned to the goal of college and career readiness. Um, Paul noted that this was the analysis that was sort of the first one to be able to look at the state, the decisions states are making in this area under ESSA, where they have total flexibility to set standards as they like. Are you sort of encouraged at all by the patterns that you see states make, the decisions that you see states making, or is it too soon to sort of evaluate how states are handling that flexibility? 
Uh, so, I mean, one point of clarification, the report repeatedly refers to the federal government setting national standards. So just that that is one area where I would t take uh, a bit of disagreement with the report. The federal government never imposed standards. They came through the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers. They really were developed by states. And that's just a fact. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, 42 states adopted them. There's also some references somewhat tangentially to a lot of states abandoning them, but achieved a really nice analysis of this late last year and found that overwhelmingly the states, even the states that went through a review process, which we would argue is largely political, have retained the core of the standards and they are, they do remain in place. Um, so the federal government never actually had a role in deciding whether the standards were acceptable or not. I believe the language in ESSA now says you have to have standards that are aligned with the entry uh, requirements for your state post-secondary yep. flagship school. Um, I think that's important. We haven't seen much oversight come out of this Department of Education um, on most things, but I think that's a reasonable standard. But even under Arne Duncan um, and John King, I think there's this perception that the federal government is like withdrawing funds or holding funds back or really punishing states that aren't doing their job when it comes to standards. But in the reality, they almost, I, I think they have literally never withheld um, Title I funds from a state. That the enforcement mechanism is more of a threat than an actuality. Yeah, though uh, under Race to the Top, it was the opposite, not a threat, but a sure. you know potential additional reward. And, and I would put the waiver flexibility in that, that same bucket bucket as well. Right. No, I don't disagree with that. But that's, that is an incentive is obviously different than you must do this or you're going to lose something. So, Paul, I'll ask the same question again about patience. Is it too soon to really see how states are handling this flexibility under the Every Student Succeeds Act, given that the law was enacted at the tail end of... 2015, uh, you know, would we really, is, should we think about this data more as a baseline for what's going to happen during the ESSA era or as an early indicator of what has happened? Well, I would expect to see that the standards themselves will remain in the same range they are currently. That is to say, I think we saw a step function shift and expectations for standards that took place as a result of the Common Core movement. And states now have accommodated themselves to these new higher standards. I think it'll be very hard for states to go, Tennessee is gonna have a hard time going back to setting the standards that they had back in 2003. I can't imagine who the governor is that's going to make that change uh, and I don't think it's just gonna slide down. I think it's, it's a big change that's occurred. Uh, I think the real question is whether or not those standards are, gonna, are going to affect meaningful behavior in the classroom in the way that Robert is talking about. And about that, I am much more, less sanguine. Ken, just one more question for you. Well, looks like you want to weigh in. Yeah, I, I'll just comment on that because I think it's a really important point. I mean, I feel like what we have done um, with some of the reform policies and certainly the work to get to higher standards is if you were mountain climbing, we've gotten to the base camp and we've done some really strong work to get there. But the, the harder work, I believe, is now climbing to the summit, which is this more practice-based, um, instructional-based work that we have to do and it is a real shift um, in the classroom to change to a student work and tasks that are at the level of the expectation that will not happen overnight i mean even with the work that we do and the support and the resources that is a real shift mm -hmm. in thinking um, but it's the right shift because that's ultimately what's going to move students forward so i think we've got a long way to go and i think this next push is is maybe even harder than what we have done to get here. And I do feel like we have to continue to have a strong sort of voice from the US Department of Education to say this matters and don't forget that this all kids need to be moving forward. That, that sort of push is very important to all of us at the state to maintain, I think, the progress that we've either made or still have to continue to move forward on. And going back to Paul's observation that he thinks it will be very hard, and I should say we'll open it up to questions from the audience uh, immediately after this, so uh, please get ready. Uh, Paul's observation that it would be very difficult for a governor or a commissioner of education to preside over a lowering of standards 
uh, in the current environment, even though many had made the decision to do just that in the past. Tennessee, as you mentioned, has been through the process of multiple standards revisions, including one where it took a look at the Common Core and decided to make some revisions intended to align the standards specifically to your own goals in that state. Um, as you underwent that process, how hard was it to prevent slippage in expectations? Was that dynamic present something you were worried about or was really the focus elsewhere? Great question. I mean, in our review process, we were, uh, one, directed to get out of the park consortium in 2014, and then the following year it was review all of your standards and move away from Common Core. So that happened two years in a row, 2014 and 2015. And the removal from the park consortium would really be an opportunity to look Absolutely. specifically at the standard, the Absolutely. proficiency standard. Yeah, and what, what we did then is to say, that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a Tennessee test that is at the depth in terms of um, expectation that we believe we were going to get through three and a half years of preparing for the park, um, and at the same time create standards with teachers. I mean, teachers were at the table during all of these conversations, and teachers were the ones who uh, helped set the, the cut scores, right, that made sure that we were meeting NAEP expectations because teachers have been part of our strategy. And I think it's a really key point. When teachers are part of the strategy, they know what kids need. Uh, you have post-secondary saying this is what you need. That really matters in making sure that your overarching community is bought in. But yes, we were concerned that the standards review process may lead us down a different road. But because the teachers who had been experiencing those higher standards now for four years were in the room saying we can't go backward, hmm. then all those instructional shifts stay. Yeah, standards changed, but the instructional shifts are there, and the expectations and the rigor is still exactly like it would have been multiple years yes. ago. When, when, when you are wisely, in my estimation, asking teachers for their input, could you just describe the, the, who those teachers were exactly? Great question. So we had a really important strategy under Race to the Top. So we were a first to the top state uh, with Delaware, and we used the, that money, a good portion of that money, to um, train Common Core coaches. That's what we called them. And those coaches were actually uh, developed across the state to literally be on the ground individuals in both math and ELA with strong training themselves. And we did training at the tune of about 15 to $16 million multiple summers during our Race to the Top phase that really pushed the instructional shifts in a very, very deep way. Uh, looking back, I wish we'd had the curriculum like paired with it at the same time, but at that moment, we were creating these cadres of teachers that will never want anything different because of the strong training that they got for multiple years, and then they were training others. So we brought some of those same people back as we were going through our review process, and then people that they had brought into the fold at the local level that are now part of our teacher leader network. We have 40 teacher leader networks that we've developed across our districts, and those are the people who are the mouthpiece for rigor and higher standards and making sure the implementation and the curriculum matches what your expectations are. Here's the Teachers have led that. The reason I ask is, and here's an idea that any state, or you, not going to be Tennessee, you've got your program. Uh, one other, the 49 other, uh, 49 other states, please steal this idea. Maybe don't, it's probably a bad idea. Um, rather than driving this through teacher leaders and a state's best teachers, I would love to see a state pull together a consortium of their mediocre teachers. And I, I'm, I'm not joking when I say that. Think about this. If you pull together and use to drive impl implementation your superstar teachers, well, they're going to, to, to come up with the ideas, the, the, the pedagogy, the curriculum, et cetera, that they can do. And then the other teachers are like, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not at that level yet. Wouldn't it be interesting if we sought the advice of teachers who are struggling? Can you do this? Can you implement it this way? What tools can we create to make you better at your job? Henry Hatka, retired government. Uh, I thought I'd just ask you, is there anything in the curriculums that could be taught that might reduce gun violence? Uh, I also note where Tennessee is on that chart that's presented there. It's in the positive territory. Uh, could you describe the significance of where that is placed uh, so the average person looking at this chart will know better exactly what's going on? It's a little hard to read it sideways and whatnot. You're specifically asking about how we teach gun safety specifically or... To reduce the incidence of gun violence. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, one... I maybe not, maybe looking broader than curriculum, just 
how sure. you're thinking about that topic. Yeah, yeah and I, I would think g generally around what we do with um, mental health and personal and social competencies and sort of general uh, the ways we approach social and emotional learning at our school level. So I'll speak to that first. Uh, we've done a great bit of work on uh, what we would consider trauma-informed learning, ACEs work in our state, uh, where we have thousands and thousands of teachers that have now been trained over the last three years in uh, those components. That has made a real difference in just being vigilant at your school around kids who need uh, an adult in their life to, to have an impact. Um, I was just in a school that has peace corners. They are a true trauma-informed school, and that elementary school is very different than many others, and we're trying to scale that up across our, our both our rural and urban districts. And on the other side of that, we've done a lot of work just generally in the non-academic space, and particularly in schools that are in need of improvement, our priority schools in our state. Um, we feel like it, we did case studies of 21 schools that have come off of our priority school list over the last four years. And when we looked at those case studies, they had some commonalities. And one of them was strong leadership. You can imagine, that's, that's going to be key. Who are your leaders at the top, and how do they create the environment? Two, what are they doing around instruction and resources and the support for the expectations around everything from instructional coaches to what they're doing specifically on getting you resources? But the third one, which was somewhat a surprise for us, is these schools that have come off of the priority school list and have had these changes, they had a really strong non-academic programming, a, a culture that was bringing in a social and emotional learning, personal and social competencies instruction that was part of their academic work. And that was really teaching them to be part of their community did they feel belong? Did they belong? Um, how were they taking care of themselves? What were they thinking about in terms of social issues in their community? And, and it really helped elevate those conversations in those schools in a way that kids felt like they actually had adults they could go to and belonged as part of a community. So I would not, I would underscore how important that has been to some of our school improvement work too. Uh, Candace, I wanted to kind of ask you to continue on a little bit in terms of a possible thesis that has been advanced by some people. So some would say that many of these school shooters are people who feel uh, humiliated, uh, alienated from the schools in which they're. There are a lot of targeting of schools, and many of these young men that are doing it are not necessarily shooting up shopping malls or something like that. Is it possible that too much emphasis on college readiness and not enough emphasis on career readiness, on vocational education or career and technical education, is fostering this feeling of alienation and humiliation? Uh, I think of Alabama, which is a neighboring state of yours and has a lot of interest in vocational education. I don't know, have you explored this at all or what? Just sure. reflect on what I'm saying. Well, there's a lot in your what? question, but I'll start I, I know. with I apologize. Uh, uh, career and technical education uh, first, and then I'll go back to something you said and some data that we have on that, that topic. Uh, first, we really have been a state that has shifted to talking about credentialing and post-secondary education and continuing your education in a much broader sense than what you would think of as just a four-year uh, college degree. Um, that has been, uh, I think, a challenge for us. I think we really started under this, everybody needs to go to a four-year college. Uh, I think that was the message. If you were to look back at seven, eight years ago, we've now transitioned under Tennessee Promise, which allows every student in our state to go to college for free with mentorship and a service component to any technical college or community college. Uh, we then aligned all of our career and technical education programs to what the market actually needs. Uh, industry aligned programs with certifications that are associated with them. So we've elevated career technical education in a way that I think every state should. Uh, it's a pathway that you could go into a career, you could then go back to post-secondary, right? So it's not an either or, you should have options and your degree and your experience should set, set you up for those options and show you what those are. So I think we're doing an extraordinary job in CT and I think we need to do more of that as we dig in on um, ensuring more of our students are taking advantage of our technical college system. To your point though, we've just had a school safety a working group that our governor called over a very short period of time, about a four-week period after the Parkland shooting, 
And uh, we, we shared a lot of data from, uh, you know, different avenues and different departments in our state government. And our Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse shared some really compelling data that what we're seeing with a lot of our school shooters is not necessarily mental health issues, that we think that. We've elevated that as that's the reason. There is some of that, but it's not the vast majority of your students. And um, what we are seeing is a bit more on the side of, uh, is there an engagement um, in the school, not necessarily a mental health challenge, but what's that engagement level um, that we saw in some in some of the data that was shared there. And so we've had to step back and say, to your point, how do we make sure our students are part of that larger community and feel like they have outlets extracurricularly in school? Um, and certainly, what are they doing on out of school hours? Because that also matters in making sure that there is an engagement level for every student. Can, can I circle back to the, oh, Go ahead. Can I, can, I, I, can I just jump in real quick? I mean, every country in the world has alienated students and adults, and the United States is the only place where they regularly commit mass murder with guns. The difference here is that they have easy access to guns, and the solution, I think we should do all these things. I think it's great that you are, but until we ban assault weapons, have background checks, and do some serious gun control, we're not going to get this problem under control. Candace, can I circle back to the first part of your response to Bill's question? Um, and hopefully get it a little bit more aligned to the uh, content of this report, which is as you try and uh, create more and more varied post-secondary options for students, including in the career and technical education space, does the fact that you've raised your academic expectations for all students, is that in tension with that goal or is it sort of complementary? So I could imagine it being intention if it sort of a need to continue to focus on traditional academic content interferes with students' ability to pursue other paths. Uh, but I could also imagine them being more complementary. Absolutely more complementary. So if you look at our nine out of our 10 highest growth areas in our state all require some type of post-secondary credential. Now, some of these are credentials that you could actually earn in high school or in some kind of dual pathway. But because of that, we know that the high expectations are a bit of a minimum. That's a minimum for everybody. And, and, and our thought is if you're going to go into our three high growth fields of healthcare, IT, or advanced manufacturing, you have to have a level of knowledge in math and science and reading that is very different than what this would have looked like 15 years ago. And so we've had to do a lot of re-education on what that looks like now for someone who's in advanced manufacturing. This is not someone standing on an assembly line waiting for things to go down uh, a, you know, a, a conveyor. This is about someone who is programming computers and they're doing robotics. And so re-educating what are these high growth fields in our communities and how do we make sure kids are prepared for them. Technical manuals. I, I've sat beside someone on a plane not too long ago. He was in an auto diesel school. I could not understand the textbook he was reading. Um, he was explaining to me what he was studying. It was very high level reading, very technical language. That's what our students are experiencing in our technical colleges and through these credentialing programs. And we're not going to get them to the, even the technical and vocational space if we don't continue to set a level of expectations for all and then differentiate based on what the student actually plans to do career wise and ask them and create those plans. And you have to create space in your schedules to do that, too. Susan Sclafani, former No Child Left Behind person at the department. Uh, you had $116 million to retrain your teachers. And I think this is the absolute critical issue for all states. How do we take teachers who themselves have never experienced this level of deeper learning that we're now expecting of all of our students to rise to the ability to not only internalize those standards, but then also know how to teach them if they don't have a hundred and some million dollars given to them for that purpose. Yeah, I, I do think money and resources do matter in the training components and the ongoing coaching with teachers. So I do, I do want to say that that obviously helped us, but we have continued to invest there um, as a state with state funding to make sure that we are elevating that um, in terms of all of our priorities. The teacher matters and the ability of that teacher to have the instruction at the level that the students need and understand the best curriculum does matter. Um, so. We know, and as a former dean of a college of education, um, I can speak very clearly to the value of what we do in our colleges of education. 
um, needs to be elevated. Mm -hmm. Um, we are not doing in our colleges of education, typically nationwide, the level of work or the level of expectation that even the students in high school are being asked to do when these teachers are going out and teaching them. Um, we continue to do awful things like article critiques and, you know, which means tell me how you feel about this article about classroom management. Well, they should be doing what we ask our students to do on our standards, which was read high quality text, uh, compare these texts to your own thinking and make an argument. You know, take put a stake in the ground and make an argument. And a lot of times our students aren't getting that until graduate school in education. They're not actually doing that in an undergraduate program. And, and that's a travesty. So we have to have faculty. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know why we always talk about teachers in K-12 are the most important element. Well, what about faculty in these colleges of education? They need to be at the level um, that they understand instruction and the depth of these curriculum and standards that our candidates need. Uh, that really does make a change. And when we changed all our faculty to make sure that they had that level of expectation, guess what? It started changing what was happening in the classroom and the choices that were being made. So uh, we as a state have some role in that. Uh, we do a teacher prep report card. Uh, we have made policy changes there. We're changing all of our teacher prep standards. We're making different decisions on our licensure test. We do feel like we have a role uh, to play in that to make sure we elevate teacher prep in the way you have to as a state to make a change. Hi, I'm Jacob Mishuk from Achieve. Um, so thank you for this report. In the last week we came out with a report that had a, a largely similar findings, different, uh, slightly different methodologies, but um, I, I, it's great to see. Um, I think one of the advantages, uh, or actually one of the disadvantages of looking at this sort of NAEP versus state proficiency is it's great to look at fourth and eighth grade. Um, however, high school, we do not have the same kind of way to look at this, partly because that of, of the 12th grade NAEP is not the best measure we could have. Um, partly there's also a lot more churn at the high school level in assessment, so I'm, I'm somewhat concerned about what are the signals um, that we're seeing from high school um, so I guess my question is, if we, if we either achieve or, or the Hoover Institution or another organization were to do a report that looked, that wanted to look at the same kind of thing, but at the high school level, what are the kinds of signals um, of success that you'd want to see um, and be reported on? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, and uh, I just want to connect that to the question about student safety. Uh, because, uh, and the comment I think that Catherine just made uh, earlier, uh, that what gets measured uh, gets accomplished. And uh, when the Nation at Risk was written, it was about the American high school. It was not about American schools. It was about the American high school. Mm. And that was the institution that was at risk. And then it just, that just disappeared from the conversation. It was about the education. And then we set up, a, a system of evaluation that basically focused on elementary and secondary education. We, we got testing in three through eight every year. You could look at growth from one year to the next. You could look at teachers. Uh, what is, the, is the student doing very well in that particular teacher's classroom? A whole in, set of institutions got built up around elementary and middle school education, leaving high school education basically off the table, not worthy of conversation, too difficult to do anything about. But that's the institution that is the disaster part of our educational system. We all know it. And actually, I disagree. I mean, I agree. I want to get rid of all those guns, Catherine. I, I, I don't disagree with your observation. But I think it's interesting that the school is being singled out as mm. the target. Now, the police were the target for the black community, and we took that as a sign that we needed to really think about the police departments in this country and what they were doing and why it was that they were the target. Well, you can understand why police are the target, because they carry guns and they kill people. And so you can see it makes sort of sense that the police would be the target. But why are the schools the target? And, and there you have to say, what is dysfunctional about this institution? So I really do agree that that's uh, and, and the academic community is responsible, too, because the academic community doesn't do the research on the high school 
in the same way. We don't, maybe we, we sort of say we don't have the tools, but I do think we have to think deeply, what are the tools that are out there that could be explored and analyzed? Uh, maybe chronic absenteeism is, is, is one of them. I, we do know this, that troubled schools have unbelievably horrific levels of chronic absenteeism, and it's just being totally ignored. Uh, we also uh, could look at uh, uh, performances uh, in, in specific subject domains on the, on, on the uh, 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 SAT, but, uh, but even more yes. on the uh, advanced yes. placement tests. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that could be done in that domain that uh, I hope that uh, uh, will be explored in, in, the, in the years that uh, are coming. And one of the interesting developments in that space has been the, uh, some requirements in some states that all students take college entrance exams, which uh, whatever its merits as a policy is a nice source of comparable uh, data. Um, and so that's one of the things I would look. And it, it is increasingly feasible to track graduates of high schools into post-secondary if states are willing to make the investment uh, in doing so. And there's a lag in getting that information about a high school's performance. So that limits its use for accountability systems for this type of research uh, would be useful. I would just add one, one thing. We've started doing something called our Drive to 55 report. Um, that is an, our attainment goal in the state. So it's unifying across K-12. I'm sorry. It's a unifying um, attainment goal for K-12 and higher education. So it means 55% of all of our students, um, our adults, are going to need to have some kind of post-secondary education to actually access the jobs that are available in our state. So to get to that attainment goal, we're now saying, what, do you, what does high school need to look like to actually get to that attainment goal? And so we're showing now data across all of our districts that are on EPSOs, early post-secondary opportunities, how many of your kids actually got these across the different uh, subgroups. Also, we're looking at ACT. All of our students take either the ACT or SAT, so we show that attainment. Uh, we're looking at wage data, which is somewhat controversial, like how are your students doing generally in a wage data when they actually get out of post-secondary or in career. And then the most exciting one to me, we now have MOUs with all of our uh, groups that actually provide industry credentials to our students who earn them, and so we can show industry credential data. How many kids are getting them? Are they in our high-growth fields? Do Are they going to serve your region? Do they stay in your region? Where do they go to college? Do they complete? Um, that is the type of data we need to be doing nationally to see as the high school actually adding the value as they bridge to post-secondary or bridge to career. And I think if we don't start pushing on that, we're going to start seeing some backsliding even more so at the high school level. Well, we have a P20 database um, that connects state government data across many, many agencies. And we have new agencies that join every year. And we do MOUs. Uh, we have a group uh, from the University of Tennessee that actually houses the data and runs reports for us. But we ask big strategic questions. Uh, we know that our students who graduate but do not go to any post-secondary make $10,020 a year. Like you, so you can ask the questions and you can try to determine, all right, based on that, how should we dig in deeper at the local community level and district level? But the Drive to 55 reports are new for us. We started them last year. We'll have our second version this year. But it's individualized for districts and is probably the most uh, important report that they get now every year and they look forward to it. And typically, the underlying source for the wage data would be unemployment insurance That's earning records. So what employers report back to the state for administering that system. Um, and so it would be limited to those in, in Tennessee specifically. That's correct. It, That's it, correct. I'll come to you in a second, Catherine. It's interesting in responding to your question, I think we've all gone in the direction of suggesting performance measures rather than expectation measures, which is would be the analog to what we're looking at here. Uh, and I agree that is sort of challenging to think about what it looks like beyond such crude indicators as number of courses that you need to complete and, and the like. Yeah, I mean, you asked earlier, Marty, um, do parents, do students actually care about proficiency? Does proficiency matter? One advantage of the SAT and the ACT and the AP, these are 
tests that parents and students really care about. And partly it's financial, because if you can earn college credit, then you can spend less on tuition when you go. And some of these states that have adopted SAT and ACT statewide, there's also an equity angle there, which is you have students from low-income backgrounds who wouldn't otherwise have access to these tests. So I think focusing on tests that actually impact students' lives and have real value associated with them could be an important motivator for getting to kids to achieve at higher levels. So I think we may have time for one more question. Um, so the, qu the question is, if there had been more of a focus on implementation of when the Common Core was first adopted and a moratorium on testing, if we would be seeing the same um, or no relationship between rising standards and uh, student achievement. I think those or, are two different things, though, two very different things. Um, a moratorium on testing, I would maybe argue for a moratorium on attaching stakes of testing to any consequences um, because it just you know it just changes the the incentive structures around it I mean you're asking people to change their practice while holding them accountable for being really good at it at the same time and that's kind of counterintuitive um, look I, you know the, the my, my answer to that implementation question this was my hope this you know as a common core um, and you know, somewhat disappointed now common core advocate uh, my hope was um, I mean, the number of people, you know, who really focus on curriculum from the policy standpoint, there's, we could meet in this room, there's more of us right now than, you know, we could meet in the washroom of the 727. Um, my hope was uh, those of us who are so wired would, would have seized that moment and said, okay, it's our turn at bat, let's go, let's talk curriculum, let's talk pedagogy, let's talk professional development. Um, most of us who are, are curriculum minded spent our time fighting Common Core. So uh, to, my, to, my, to my mind, it was a bit of a lost opportunity. Um, so I'm not sure that, that that's the thing that I think left the rails is that you know, whoever the question was, the 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 the, um, the 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 political the politics of it just were toxic. Any observations, Candace? Yeah, I would only add. I mean, coherence matter matters and alignment matters. So uh, ultimately, the test points to the performance of what you're hoping for. And a lot of times the standards can't be fully understand until you see what that performance measure is. Then it's like the aha moment of, oh, that's what that standard meant the whole time. And then that alignment of the curriculum and the choices you make on resources and PD that's aligned to that, that's like the magic uh, sauce to this whole recipe. And so when you have all of that aligned, then you start getting growth. And that's what this is ultimately all about. So the alignment matters and, and having one without the other or holding some accountable but not others, it, it just ends up not creating the coherence that we believe has really mattered in our state. So I think we're uh, at time. Um, I started out the conversation by noting the mood of hope but the acknowledgement that more work needed to be done. And that's certainly what I sort of was left with from this conversation, that there are a lot of questions that people like me who have paid attention mostly to the policy level uh, really need to get up to speed on if we want to be constructive in trying to help higher expectations actually translate into improved performance. So that and go caps uh, <laughs> are my takeaways. So please join me in welcoming, uh, thanking the panel. <laughs>